Start recording. Going to take us now to a century ago. It's actually almost a century ago to when my father was a young student. And on this is the Shabbat of my father's yard site. Uh, next week, we're going to continue. I want to talk about the Anmaimonian uh, scholars, the kind of, uh, we may say, the uh, reaction, philosophical reaction, intellectual reaction to the Rambam and some great people like, great thinkers like uh, Rabbi Yudal Levi and the Ramban, uh, even Virol, and just some samples from others. And then uh, move on uh, as we're preparing towards Pesach, start getting us into the theme of Pesach. So I'll come up with some things towards as we approach Pesach. And uh, any topics that you want, please send them to me, send them to me. Uh, and if any of you want to take a topic and put your step your feet in the water and lead a topic discussion, let me know, let me know. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to the screen and I'm going to take us uh, way far back uh, by our time frame. As I said, my uh, my father was, for very justifiable reasons, as I'll explain his life story, uh, a late starter in having a family. Because he had to pass through World War II before he could get started. So um, he was born 1901 which would make him now 120 if he had lived, lived uh, that long. Uh, it was, he passed away 45 years ago. He was just uh, hitting 75, 70, you know, just about 75 when he passed away. So because we're still within the theme of Purim, I thought I would open with this to, so you could hear him. I have a few soundtracks of him when he was serving as rabbi. Let's see if I can get this one. But this one of a Purim celebration. Let's see if I can get this. Right. Yeah, there we go. Purim celebration in a in a refugee camp somewhere in the area outside uh, Frankfurt. He was the certainly as the chief rabbi oh, of the Salzang. state of Hesse. Camp was Salzheim. Uh, this would have been outside of Frankfurt. So Salzheim, you say? Salzheim. Yes. I'm going to take your word for it because I don't have a note. Yeah, from, that was the, that's where the camp, TDP camp was. Uh -huh. So what I think is it's also being recorded on radio because he talks about uh, my dear listeners. So I think he's there and he's listening to the So I hear the Hazen starts up. He can sing along with that. Say hi, yom, yom, forem, anoyim, mumato. Emirov, nezam, vera, venit, machet, eito. The <laughs> von zwei Halbfeiertagen umrahmt. Den einen feiern wir am 25. des Monats Kifle, des letzten Herbstmonats, 
den zweiten, am 14. des Monats Ada, des letzten Wintermonats. Der erste Halbfeiertag ist das Hanukkah-Fest und gilt der Erinnerung an die Siege der Makkabäer gegen Antiochos Epiphanes, die noch auf eigenem Boden zur Zeit des zweiten Tempels ausgefochten wurden. Der andere ist das Purimfest und gilt der Erinnerung an die glücklich überstandene Verfolgung von Seiten Hamans zur Zeit des ersten Exils im Altpersischen Reich. Okay. So I'll just give you a flavor of his voice because I'm sure not that many of you are that mm. fast with German. Yeah. Maybe Joe, you remember enough to follow it. But mm -hmm. he's introducing the, to the listeners, he says, the winter is bound in Jewish calendar by two festivals. I had that too. All right, small festivals. On the winter, the end of the beginning of the winter is Hanukkah, the end of the winter is Purim. Uh, and then he uh, goes into the significance of Purim. Uh, Purim that, so I say that, that's that, just a, an the second, experience. The second, yeah, the, sec, the second Hamma. The second half, yeah, so now he's reflecting upon what has yes. happened now to the Jewish community and talking to them. Yeah, so I, now I'm going to shrink this down because we I don't want to get this on <coughs> and move over here, enlarge the page for us here. One second, make this visible. Okay, good. So I've put this up so it'll be visible. For you. So, uh, just to introduce you to my father. Was born, as I said, 1901 in Dolina. Uh, it was then Austro-Hungary, uh, and he represents <laughs> the transition from medieval Judaism to modern Judaism. Austro-Hungary. Uh, it was relatively slower to to Westernize. Now, his family already. They were already westernized. His father already had gone to a public school under the Austrian system. He already saw too that he went to gymnasia. The Orthodox Jew, but made sure his son went to gymnasia. There was the formal high school. But the Hasidim around them were still Hasidim. And they would attack the westernized kids. There was resentment, the old and the new. Uh, World War I broke out. He fled from uh, Galicia to Vienna. So uh, you have to understand this. Jews have their social rankings also, like all peoples. And the German Jews consider themselves the elite. They look down on the East European Jews. So it was transition. Like so many Jews in Vienna, where they were under the German culture, the German culture, but they were of East European roots what some of the Germans would call halb asiatic, half Asian. Mm. Well, he, he was also, uh, as I say, brought up now going to gymnasium in a very westernized or Europeanized education, as well as classic rabbinic, Talmudic training. So all the one and both, have both. Uh, and so he was in the Hashemeh HaTzair. Some of you familiar with that? Mm. That was the yeah. most left-wing Zionist movement left you could be in without yeah. being in the Communist Party. Yeah. Basically, that's it. So the leader of his group was Mary Ari, who became the founder of the uh, Mapam, Mapam in Israel, Mapam Party. Yeah. Um, and everybody who was everybody was a Marxist in those days. Everybody was a Marxist in those days. His best friend in high school, later on left to France, became a leader of the Communist Party in France. Later on, he rejected communism, but became, was a major French literary critic. So that's the atmosphere. So he went to study, he was active in Zionist movement and he decided to go study political science to advance his involvement. And so he did his doctorate in uh, 1928. That's when he got his doctorate, Parliamentarism, System and Crisis. I'm gonna talk about what he was writing and how it reflects on our times. And then he went to Berlin in 1932. Not a good time to go to Berlin because within a year, uh, Hitler was in yeah. power. Mm -hmm. right, he was there in Berlin. He was active in the student at the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, a mouthful, the academy, the higher academy mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. scientific yeah. study of Judaism. There he is, the young student. I, I assume this is a picture somewhere when he's a student. There's a, a seal on it. I, it's, it was not in color. I, I have a 
colorization uh, format. So give him a little bit of color. Here he is as a young man. Now he's about 30, as I can figure. He's visiting with his uncle on the, and his brother on the coast of Dalmatia, right? What's Yugoslavia then? Dalmatia is now, I think, uh, mm. Croatia. Croatia, I think now. All right, notice very nice, full-figured, mm. happy man, good circumstances. That's the, that's the last time he's a happy man for the next 15 years, give or take. Uh, that was his student ID, right. So in 1935, he was imprisoned by the Nazis for two years. It was a set of charges of uh, moving funds. The Nazis had imposed strict monetary controls. He was helping somebody Jewish move funds to get something set up. Uh, Jews are moving funds to try to get things going because the Nazis blocked most businesses. Uh, he got trapped. Uh, so he spent two years he says that actually they were very good years because the Nazi regime at that time did not want to kill everybody. They left him alone. So he was actually able to do his rabbinic ordination sitting in prison by uh, correspondence course. When he got out, he was given his uh, smicha, his actual ordination. Again, by this time, all by long distance because everybody is scattered. And his thesis was a study of the psychology of Jewish heretics. I've been looking for the thesis. Nobody could find it for me, which is too bad. It would have been interesting. This is his prison record, Plotzensee. Plotzensee is uh, Brandenburg near Berlin. Mm. Uh, so uh, he was there when it was still safe, relatively speaking. You see his birthplace, Dolina, Poland. At that time, it was now considered Poland. So they used that as the record. Well, he fled first to Vienna because the Germans, uh, at the condition to get him out of jail was that he leave Germany, never set foot again. <laughs> he, he ran to Ber uh, Vienna. And as soon as the Germans came into Vienna, he wasn't going to wait around. And so he and his brother also fled to Czechoslovakia. They're hoping to go to Argentina, but they never got the visa in time. So they ended up going east instead of west. And lo and behold, the Germans have their uh, march into Via, into Czechoslovakia, thanks to uh, Neville Chamberlain and Peace in Our Time. And first thing that the Germans did was round up all suspect characters. So, so they had a record on him. They rounded him up. He spent half a year in a notorious political prison. Uh, it was an old castle that had been remade. It was famous as actually prison of the nations. The Austrians used it to capture all their political prisoners for 200 years before that. And it is known as Spielberg. Well, that in German is Spielberg. Hey, there's the Spielberg family. I don't know if they're connected to that prison, but that's the same name. So this is a beautiful picture inside the castle where my father had to spend six months. All right, so as soon as World War II broke out, he was released on the German-Soviet demarcation line, just you know, inside Poland when Poland was split up, he was able to escape uh, to the interior of the Soviet Union, uh, worked uh, as a chemist near Stalingrad and later Frunze, Bishkek, which is now Kyrgyzia. Uh, it is not far from the border of Xinjiang province where the Chinese government now has its concentration camps, or let me correct it, re-education camps for Uyghur Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. That's where, not so far. Um, you ask, how did a rabbi uh, and a doctorate of political science become a chemist? You do what you do to get a job in the, in the Soviet Union, you become a chemist. And nobody jo has jobs for rabbis or political scientists. And definitely not for members of the Communist Party or the Zionist Party, because those were picked up right away and sent to Siberia. Communists especially were eliminated as quickly as possible. So 15 years go by, my father comes back to Austria. Here's a picture of circa 1947. Uh, he's been in liberation already about a year and a half. You notice that he's very gaunt and skinny. You look at the picture of him as a young man. Uh, I, he told me, you know, when I was in the Soviet Union, I had actually plenty of food to eat. I couldn't eat it. It was the anger, the, the fear of living in the Soviet system was so great. I couldn't digest what I was eating. Right. So, the end of World War II, he returned to Austria. He headed a People's University for Refugees and DP camps in Hallein, near Salzburg, Austria in 1947, then served as a lecturer for the refugees under the 
to his central committee and he was going to work on an article research on life and struggle of Jewish DPs in Austria. I still have his manuscript uh, to that. Okay, here is a picture in Austria. He's rededicating a synagogue in Mozart's Salzburg. And very Oops. perfect for us, it says, Zachor Tasher Salacha Amalek. This is the theme of Shabbat Zachor, the theme of Purim. That's him up there on the bima. Yude vergiss nicht das Katzet. True, do not forget the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Right? There is that tie-in. So. 1948, he served as the first Landes Rabbiner, state rabbi of Hesse in Germany. That's Frankfurt in the region. That's where I was born and chairman of the Union of Rabbis of Germany. His chief task was to unite the German and East European survivor communities. It was a, still a core remnant of the original Yekes German community, and then it was Europe was flooded. Germany was flooded with East European Jews. It was the safest place for Jews after the war under the American army. Not so much under the British. Their no. their areas were much. The conditions were much harsher. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and the Bergen, Bergen Belsen uh, much harsher conditions. Uh, but he was in a good position because he was both East European and German Kulturkreise. So he could communicate between the two sides. And he also coordinated efforts between the American officials and the new German government, especially in the fight against the resurgence of Nazism and anti-Semitism. Nazis were still active. The underground was still active. Uh, so this is from the bulletin of the high commissioner. And I'm going to enlarge this for you a little bit so you can see here from the dedication of the synagogue in Frankfurt. It still exists. Mm, it's been yeah. remodeled since then. Beautiful uh, job of remodeling. You can see this was uh, 1950. The speaker, Max Meyer, the head of the community, was my godfather and his was the brother-in-law of one of the major leading, was a German general that signed the surrender terms. Because he had a Jewish, he had a wife who had a Jewish brother, something like that. So that's how he saved, he, was survived. he survived. And here is my father, holding Torah scroll in the center is the cantor. There's my father. And there's Rabbi Blut, who was his uh, Dayan, the rabbinic judge for the Jewish community, towards the Orthodox community, who signed my documents when I wanted to get married, indicating, proving that I was Jewish. Here he is at the center stage. Notice that he's wearing a beret. He refused to wear the classical rabbinic hat, uh, which was like the bishop's hat. He said, we are going to be this thing. Uh, the choir, and you see the pipe organs, it's the second largest organ in Germany, was in that synagogue. And here the dignitaries, the uh, retiring ECA mission chief in Germany, the wife of the high commissioner, John J. McCloy, uh, the federal minister for refugees, and the president of the German Central Banking Council, right? Some major dignitaries appeared at that. Let me go ahead, go back to... Size down, and then came to the States in 1951, served as a rabbi in several congregations, member of the rabbinical assembly, passed away March 16, 1976. So his documents are at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and there's a link if anybody wants to follow it up to find the actual documents. So what's my theme for today? When, I'm going back now, it is just about 100 years ago. Okay, just about 100 years ago, my father enrolled in uh, the Faculty of Law at the University of Vienna. Uh, a faculty of Law was a cover for a lot of social sciences, so not just law. And his area was Staatswissenschaft, right? The science of running society, political science. So my father typed his thesis at the time. Hitler had just come out of Landsberg prison and had not had a single electoral victory. Is National Socialistisch Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, that's the Nazis, barely scored a few seats in the Reichstag, the parliament. Nazism was so insignificant that in this thesis, my father did not mention it. Right, he was writing 1926, did not mention Nazism. This was the golden 20s, the golden 20s, the roaring 20s in the Weimar <coughs> Republic, the roaring 20s in the United States. The world economy was solid. It's not yet 1928. For the most part, Woodrow Wilson had succeeded in his goal. The world must be safe for democracy. So it was uh, in Europe to most part. 
it seemed to everybody, but not to the highly observant student of political science, Jan William Weinberg. Uh, William in English, Wilhelm in German. He was just 25 and he typed his thesis, Parliamentarism, System and Crisis. So he finished his studies, defended his thesis on November 14, 1928, received his signed doctorate. Very good period to get the doctorate. It was almost 10 years to the date of the armistice, 10 years after the armistice of World War I, November 11, 1918, that war that would make the world safe for democracy. 10 years later, almost to the date, the opening uh, would bring us to the opening of the genocide of the Jews, Kristallnacht. November 9, 1938, oh, right in between these two significant events. So here's the cover of his thesis. My father's cousin had been, a, go, had, was able to go to the University of Vienna sometime in the 60s and was able to find it and was able to get the copy out for us. This is the actual doctorate, notice in Latin, and the name on top, pay good attention, Theodorus Initzer and his signature on the bottom. Why is that significant? Here's the man who was the rector of the University of, Virginia, of Vienna. And this is him a few years later in his robes as Cardinal Initzer of Austria. This is the Cardinal who would be known as the Heil Hitler Cardinal, right? Because the same Initzer invited the Germans to protect Austria from civil war and breakdown. He signed the doctorate that talked about the breakdown of democracy, parliamentary democracy, and it was the man who brought in Hitler because he, he was afraid it was the only way to save society in, in, in Austria. And he and the Austrian bishops had admonished Austrian Catholics then to vote ja, to vote yes in a plebiscite to agree to the Anschluss, the union, and signed it with Heil Hitler, Time Magazine reported in that year. Now the Pope was furious with him and the Cardinal later on would regret his decision. He realized, he did, he did realize it was a tragic, tragic mistake, but it was too late. So here's what's relevant for us. I'm gonna read you some excerpts from the doctorate. There's this young kid who's barely wet behind the ears. He talks about modern culture. We're so proud of the result of the creation of our modern culture and we're so accustomed to see in the parliamentary system, the last word in political culture, we have hardly recognized that it has begun to degenerate. It's losing its purpose that we've come to this time when the parliamentary system becomes the topic of debate, which is flaws are widely known and the whole world is speaking of a crisis of the parliamentary system. Now parliamentary system, different than the American system and that it is a multi-party system where the party, the, the, the leading coalition of parties decides who runs the government. American system, it's a winner take all two parties and presidents separate from the parties. But the, the problems are similar. The problems are similar. Signs of this crisis can be found in all European states, not only Italy and Russia, where new political systems instead of parliamentarism are being created, right? Fascism, Mussolini has just taken over, Russia, Lenin had just taken over. We have in mind those countries with strong parliamentary constitutions. France, England, Germany, by now actually had a strong parliamentary system. I mean, it had an existing parliamentary system also under the Bismarck, uh, under the Reich, under the uh, Kaiser. It had a parliamentary system and also smaller states. Overall, we find an inability of the parliamentary system to guarantee a proper and stable leadership create a good and lasting government and provide a beneficial and ordinary administration. Look at Italy, mm. They're a government every two days. Look at Israel, parliamentary system. It's going through its fifth election. You can mm. see how there's an inherent instability in a parliamentary system. So he looks at the aftermath of World War I and the failure of governments before, during and after. Failure to prevent the war, failure to lead the war well, and failure to wrap, wrap up the work safely and well. So there's been an all around failure of belief in the system. The masses see how parties tear and throw at each other. You know, just listen to our parties today, tear and throw at each other. As the members of parliament speak and speak without end and achieve nothing concrete. British mm -hmm. parliaments, they, they, they really know how to shout at each other if you ever listen to them. Israeli Knesset, just listen to them shouting at each other. Americans are very polite compared. 
They have been disillusioned and mistrusting, seeking other forms of political leadership. So the idea of a dictator is today popular in many European states. Parliamentary rule is ever more unpopular. Its existence is in danger. Many political thinkers, historians, and philosophers of history see its imminent demise. Right? We, we have a sense of this. Um, when the Soviet system fell, there was a, a major historian said, this is the end of history. Basically, they, the procedure of history now leaves the door open for democratic governments. And it has not been, it's happened, and then it's been shrinking back where we see a, a strengthening of, not necessarily dictatorships, but authoritarian rulers, Turkey, Russia, we see it. So the origins of the decline go to the origins of the parliamentary system. In other words, the system has its own failure built in. Two key foundations. The first foundation the principle of democracy, that the people alone determine their fate. The second foundation, the principle of representation. It's impossible for each citizen to be directly and constantly involved with all political questions each is a representative who is appointed makes decisions in his name. When the Americans are debating the Constitution, they are looking at the same question. They're very well aware of this problem. Um, and the only society where it had existed, where people actually vote, was in Switzerland. But Switzerland was a small country, voting to small cantons. So it was easy for everybody to know everybody and to get together. That the, we, you have in the United States a few places where you have something like a town hall. But the Americans did not design a parliamentary or a democracy. Well, it's they not, not designed a democracy. It is not. This is not a democracy. It's a republic. Uh, okay, and they did, so, that's yeah, a, so that's not what we've designed here. Right. The republic has. That's a shift. And he talks about that later on. Yeah. But we, we we still have some of the similar problems. It was a, It was intended to try to avoid it. So look what happens then. So they become disillusioned and mistrusting, seeking other for okay, go ahead, sorry. Parliamentarism is therefore representative democracy and the very principle of representation from its beginning, there is a danger. Montesquieu and Rousseau in the time already foresaw this danger and recognized the contradiction with democratic and representative principles, right? There's a conflict. The will of the people cannot be truly expressed only through their elected representatives, they point out. The representative must willingly or not twist and falsify the will of the people. We have this, always this sense, the people we elect are not really reflecting what we want. We have this distrust. The prophecies of theoreticians of modern democracy have shown the more the parliamentary system has developed and the greater the state has become, so more rich and complicated has the political life become. And more and more, the parliament becomes independent, absolute, unaccountable to the people, a world to itself, right? The, the, in other words, the governing body begins to be disconnected from the people that have elected it. So polit politics has become a science with its unique discipline, methods, and secrets. Today, it is so complicated and twisted that the common man with average reasoning ability cannot find his way in it. All questions and problems in the political world become part of a completely new system. Its solution no longer depends on the real necessities, rather on the laws and tendencies of the immediate moment. If you follow how are decisions being made, you have, uh, what's, what's the word? They, they do these focus groups. You, you, you have a focus group and the focus group, and then you come up with a, what's the key word that we're going to use? What's the sound bite we're going to use? All these things. And again, it's both the American system and the European system. We, we are see, play, jockeying for position and the public feels it. So the politician has become a new entity. He's no longer the representative of thousands of fellow citizens, no longer the fighter and spokesperson for, other, for the others. A man for whom politics is his calling, who has become an expert in the wisdom and secrets of the hidden science of politics. Right? You make your way up, you know your way, that's where you're going through must be our legal framework today no longer managed by the parliament. Instead, it has become a matter of state bureaucracy. If anybody's read Kafka, the process, right? He's brought up for a trial. He has no reason, no, he doesn't understand how, he doesn't understand what, he can't get in, can't get out. That's the feeling of the citizen in the state bureaucracy. And that was Czechoslovakia was carrying over the rules of the Austrian uh, system as it broke out of that. So this happens naturally when one thinks of what degrees of knowledge and expertise it is necessary to shape a law. So we're going to make a law 
you know that you know how sausage is made. You don't want to know how sausage is made. That's what happens when you're shaping a law. Or they, what is a camel? A camel is a horse that a committee put together. So increasingly the politician loses the common interests of his constituents and less and less does politics arise from the realistic needs and wants of the people. It's key issues of contention, nothing with real life and it becomes purely tactical politics for its own sake. The parliament has ceased to be a suitable apparatus for dealing with the public good, resting on the most possible broad foundation, stands for artful and lectioneering mathematics. Right? We follow it. I mean, we, we've sensed that in the United States also. I, I'm going to, I'm running for election. I am feeling this group is this percent, this group is this percent. It's, it's a contradiction built in into any kind of representative system. You know, you, you can't live with it, you can't live without it. Delegates no longer represent the people against the state authority, right? The sense, the state. And it, it, you listen to people talking today. Also, the state, the bureaucrat, anybody who's worked with any kind of government agency in any position, top or bottom, understands. You're dealing with the bureaucrat, go and talk to the wall sometimes. Uh, with, with, right? They fail to act as a vent for individual initiative and freedom of the soul. Delegates legislative effectiveness identify with the will of the state and its political activity. His attachment to the influence of party organization restricts himself to the influence of the party leader. Now, it, to some extent, the American system, you could break from the party, right? You, you have more uh, personal representation. The British system also, uh, there is more ability to break from the party, but they're still playing a lot of these number games. That's a bad so, system. Huh? It's it's That's the, the it's the, it's what are the, who said it? Democracy is a terrible system, but it still beats anything else. That's um, the problem. It's a built in. It's inherent in the system. So it's no wonder people are disappointed and different to Parliament. Charles Churchill. Huh? Churchill. That's it. Charles Churchill. He was, right. Yeah. Parliamentary politics. They lose their loyalty. So then he talks about well, what happens then is other countries are looking for a new political form to inherit the role of the parliamentary system. So. Now in Europe, two such systems, fascism in Italy and Sovietism in Russia. Notice you know what? He's not even talking about uh, Nazism in Germany. Nazism really is, is a different beast even from fascism. It takes a, it, it goes far to the extreme of fascism. Even. Uh, what the advocate here about fascism, what the advocates of just dictatorship intend is the application of extra parliamentary means to achieve political demands. Understand well that those of a far and wide view and can move above the needs of separate groups can, seeing the hardship of the totality, see this machine that makes much racket and much of little good, <coughs> therefore they're dissatisfied. They think of the dictator as someone who can lead people by stark will over all difficulties. All right? We have a weakness for the strong man on a horse. And so the Italians went that route. And then, of course, uh, he follows up and he says, the problem will be that it is only as long as that strong man is in existence. The strong man falls apart or dies. It's very hard to follow through on that. And so the fascist system he says, would eventually disintegrate. It's dependent on just on an individual. He says the other system provides the great concept that's missing in fascism. So fascism was built on the strong man. The other system is built on concept. The Soviet state upon a new foundation, the economic basis of means of production derived from the Marxist concept of economy is the central force of history. So life is organized so the individual can find its purpose fulfilled to the highest in the productivity of the factory under the control of the workers. That's where, when the worker controls his production, he finds his highest productivity. He is tied to his labor. Its failure lies in the overestimation of the significance of economics. A people cannot establish a political organization on the basis of economics alone. It's too fully subject to industrialization. Uh, and he is, this is 1928. They're not yet aware of the extremes in which the Lenin-Stalin system is enforcing collectivization at the cost of tens of millions. And at the, force, at the cost of tremendous uh, shutting down of individual thought and at the cost of eating even their own leaders and leadership. That comes out later. 
So on the other side, so he says, well, here's the conflict that we see today. Labor organizations, European labor organization, more heavily socialist than Americans, bend parliament to the will in their direction. On the other, corporations back in nationalist movements, so there's awakened Hungary, fascism, or Juna, Yugoslavia, Ku Klux Klan in America, which press on parliament, right? So you have in these democratic systems, these two contradictory forces weighing on the parliamentary system. And then as it says, well, Italy and Russia, they're taken over completely. Italy fascism is a corporate fascism. It's a state fascist, state corporation, much like China is a state corporation, not truly a communist system, state corporation system. Russia is the communist system. The state owns everything, lock, stock, and barrel. So he goes on with what are contemporary attempts in his day to reform the system and increasing methods of direct democracy by the initiative process, right? Which he says at that time, which I said had become part of American polity, right? The referendum it was the beginning of the 1900s when we get the referendum system in California, for example. And that also has its problems because who's pushing the referendum and what, at what interest? And is it really being sold as what it says? And then by stating the value of more direct voter choice of the representative, as in the British system, right? I mentioned that, right? Because in the British system, you are voted by your community, not in the European parliamentary system where you're one slate across the country. The ideas of plebiscite and referendum return rule to the people, not the party machinery, right? That was what they were hoping for. But even voting for a leader independent of a party system and voting for everyone, they're still easily manipulated by vested interests of left and right. So left, he concludes, he concludes, this is his hopeful conclusion at the end, the parliamentary system of necessity has to survive. It's still the one essential necessary form of a structured society. It makes the need for reform even more vital to prevent the demise of parliamentary democracy, right? So in Germany, we Germany, know- Poland. Germany was- Germany was suffering a, a big recession at the time. Uh, so the parliamentary system failed to provide a better economical situation, yeah. I think. So I asked my father about that. And he said, you yeah. know, he said that the German economy was still much stronger after World War I. It still was stronger than the other European <laughs> states. And so, the, yeah, they had the tremendous inflation right after World War I, where they were taking a wheelbarrow to buy a, full of uh, marks to buy a, a barrel of a loaf of bread, but mm. they quickly reorganized themselves. And uh, so he says, you know, relatively speaking, the Germans were not bad off. Uh, it, so it was not so much the economics, and economics is one factor. The other factor was the resentment of loss. Uh, and I think this has been widely remarked that when the Germans surrendered in World War I, they had not suffered. The French suffered and Poland suffered where the battles were, and Austria-Hungary, that's where the battles were going on. But inside Germany proper, or Austria proper, uh, there was very little damage. They did not see, and they could not see that their army was basically worn down to nothing. And that's why the army had to surrender. They could not see it. And that's why the Germans felt betrayed and couldn't understand that they had lost. And so they were easily sold on the idea of Dolchstos. We were stabbed in the back. We were betrayed. Well, who betrayed us? You look for, well, who stands to benefit? Oh, the Jews, right? That made the Jews a very easy target. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in in, uh, in Germany uh, and, and Austria, those two areas. Um, the Jews are always a target. It's an easy target, easy target. Uh, you know the story that uh, 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 an anti-Semitic and a Jew are debating, uh, you know, what's the cause of everything and the anti-Semitic says the Jews are the cause of all our, our problems and the, and the, mm -hmm. the yeah. Jew answers back, yes, you're right. And also the bicycle riders. And the anti Semitic looks at him and says, Why the bicycle riders? And the answer back says, Why the Jews? <laughs> it's just as much <laughs> logic. But you don't need logic to target frustrations. And frustrations can come from anything across the board. Uh, our worry here, they say, We have a lot of frustrated people. Can we direct frustration in a positive direction instead of a negative direction? And that's going to be the big challenge uh, between left and right. And we are very polarized right now. And say, well, they're like this, or they're like this. 
but uh, we, we have to get across that polarization somehow. So these, I, I, I pulled these out. My father went on, as I say. Uh, uh, he then went on to un understand physically what it is to live under a fascist regime, a Nazi regime, and then under the pure Soviet system uh, and came away uh, hating both systems, obviously. And uh, when he got in the United States, uh, you know, felt that the American system is so much stronger uh, and, and healthier. And it's ultimately the, the two-party system, for all that we uh, get upset that um, you, know, you don't feel that it really represents, because the two-party system ultimately must negotiate between each other, it prevents a complete imbalance in either direction. Because neither party can afford to miss the middle. So as much as they may you know, shout, we want X or we refuse Y, ultimately they, they manage, at least historically they manage. So he said, look, in the, in the 1930s, after the Great Recession, the recession in the 1930s was much worse than for Germany. But, and, and the United States was on the verge of some fascist takeover, could have been on the verge. The system responded. Uh, and, you know, and, and so there are questions. Well, did Roosevelt really do the right things with the, um, uh, the work programs and the, uh, all the other social programs? And as far as economics go, maybe they didn't work. Where they did work was giving people a sense, well, we're trying something. And when people feel we're trying something, so they have hopes that they're willing to go along. And that was you know, that the, the, the balancing act that American system has managed to carry out. So uh, we, we, we hope that that continues, that we continue this balancing act, bringing the opposites together rather than at each other. And, then, you know, and it's a hope and a prayer. <laughs> That's it. So those are my thoughts. Uh, from uh, my, in memory of my father on this yard site. And um, I hope in my prayer that uh, our system does carry through and does work its way correctly. Right. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi you know, you mentioned before that the, your father was there when uh, Hitler came out of the prison from Landsberg. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you had. I was I was in this prison in 1946 for three days. Ah, oh, nice place. I was, the, I was in the same prison, and then I was in Landsberg from 1944 to the liberation, actually. Ah. It was in a camp called uh, Sub Camp from Dachau. Ah. Camp number seven was in Landsberg. Yeah, uh, well, that's it. look at these places that we end up in. Yeah, you've been in every every notorious place. What can I tell you? Yeah, I tell you? yeah. I was three days <laughs> in that prison. Yeah, yeah Landsberg. So the prison my father was in, um, the, the one in Berlin. First, he was arrested and taken to one called the Moabit. That was his interrogation prison. And uh, later on, uh, it was a notorious place for the Nazis to put their undesirables. And then Brandenburg, uh, where he spent the main yeah. time, also after he left, was used uh, as a place where they would execute their un unwanted political leadership. Uh, by the way, in prison, you had, he said, they were either communists, which made sense, or real Nazis. In other mm -hmm. words, as soon as Hitler came to power, you may know, he immediately arrested his true believers. There was another leader, Romer, who was even more militant than Hitler. And Hitler recognized immediately that Romer would move things too fast and was there. So he arrested his followers and put them in prison also. Just like Lenin and Stalin, when European communists escaped to Europe, they immediately put them in prison because they recognized that they were communist idealists who really believed in the system and they would start making a ruckus. And so they put them mm -hmm. away also. Yes. And that's all right. That's how you maintain control. You control your yeah. true believers in order to be able to get what you need. Ah, oh, that's the that's, that's the power, world. Rabbi. Huh? That's, that's how you keep that's power. That's right. That's about power. That's not about ideology. Yeah, yeah. You, but your power, your power. But you know, if people gave in, at, at, at least in Stalin, you read the trials 
and the, the kangaroo courts and so on, and the people who are going to be liquidated actually believe they deserve because they let down the great leader. And if you, you use your true believer's belief in you to maintain that power. And then that's the, what they call the useful idiots. Yeah. So use that term. The useful People idiots. who sent, were sent to the gulags didn't believe that, that Papa Stalin yeah. Joe would have done that. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They believe it. They thought yeah. he was the greatest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Papa Joe and all the characters. Okay. So I wish everybody a good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. And, and, and good health. And good get out of, And we get out of the virus healthy and well as well. Okay. Everybody, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. And Shavua told everybody. Uh, good Vach, all set coming up. And we'll start getting ready for Pesach. All right. Yeah.